one of the first orders of business for Jesus when he first started his earthly ministry was to be led into the wilderness by way of the Holy Spirit to be tempted. Now, you have to ask yourself, why is that? The reason being is that Jesus wanted to deal with unfinished business with the adversary. See, the, the whole reason that Jesus had to come on the scene was because Satan tempted Eve in the garden. And when he tempted Eve in the garden, um, Eve and Adam um, were uh, removed from the presence of God because of their disobedience. You know, the, the devil shows up in the garden over in Genesis chapter three. So it has the Lord said that you can't eat of every tree. And Eve responds and says, well, no, we can eat of the fruit of the tree. But this one particular tree we can't eat of. Uh, we will surely die. And the devil says, you will not die. You become like God. And God knows that. And so Eve, the text says, look at the fruit. It become pleasant to the eyes and what have you. And so she partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, of course, they were kicked out of the garden because of their disobedience to God. But the enemy used that temptation now to get victory over Adam and Eve in the garden. And so because he used temptation to get uh, victory over them, Jesus now comes on the scene to get to take back what the enemy have stolen from humanity and says the first order of business now is I'm going to let you tempt me and I'm going to show you that you're not going to get the upper hand on me like you like you did with Adam and Eve. And so the first order of business was for Jesus now to be led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And so we see here how nothing's new under the sun when it comes to the adversary. He has no new tricks. He has no new strategies. He still uses the same old thing that he was using from Genesis. And that is temptation. So if you and I as believers, if we can understand um, the operation of temptation or how temptation works, it gives us a better uh, chance of, of refusing or resisting the temptation that the enemy throws at us. Now, you can't stop temptation. I mean, that's just, temptation is common to man. And the text says, every man is tempted. And so temptation is not something that you can get around. It's something that you have to learn how to handle. And we see here in the text how Jesus handled temptation. He took it head on. He took it head on. He was led into the wilderness to be tempted. And so he took temptation head on. And so if you and I can be honest with ourselves when it comes to temptation and recognize we're going to be tempted, we're going to have to deal with it and take it head on, it gives us a better opportunity to get victory over the temptation when it comes our way. Now, what is the nature of temptation? A few definitions here. Temptation is an enticement to take God-given desires and use them beyond the limits that God has placed upon us. In other words, God has given us the desire to eat. We have to eat to nourish our bodies. But there is a temptation from some to overeat, whereby you get over into gluttony. God has given us the uh, desire to uh, have sexual um, relations but sexual relations now, of course, we all know is for for covenant relationships. But some of us allow ourselves to operate outside of a covenant relationship, thus uh, abusing that that desire that God has placed in our lives. And then, of course, temptation is deception. It's a lie because the enemy will try to convince you that the temptation is good for you only for you to find out that anytime you're tempted to do something outside of the will of God, it ends up um, harming you and it ends up in destruction on it. It ends up in a very, um, uh, the end result is very, um, can be very destructive. And so it, it's a lie. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the text says, there has no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. 
But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, this text says four things over here in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. It says four things. First, the text says that temptation is common to man. Now, what does that mean? It means simply that if you're being tempted with something, you're not the first one to be tempted in that area. It's common. It's not something brand new. It's not the devil picking on you. It's not you being singled out um, in terms of this particular temptation that you may be dealing with. Temptation is common to man. And so whatever you may be tempted with tonight, there's thousands of others who are dealing with that same area of temptation in their lives. So it's common. The second thing that this text says is that, that God is faithful. One of the most important things that you can take from temptation or the understanding of temptation is the fact that God is faithful. God is faithful to us when we are under attack by the enemy in terms of the area of temptation. The third thing is that God will not allow us to be tempted above what we can handle. I love this verse because it's very clear that if you're being tempted in a particular area, it's because God knows that you can handle that temptation. This text says that God will not let you and I be tempted above what we can handle. So if you're being tempted tonight in a particular area and you say, I just don't know what I'm going to do about this. I just I keep failing in this particular area. I want you to know that you can handle that temptation because the text makes it very clear that if the temptation gets to you. It's because God knows that you have the ability to get victory over that temptation. And then the fourth thing that this text says is that that God gives us a way out. He gives us a way out of the temptation that comes our way. So we don't have to be um, over concerned about temptation. We just have to understand how the enemy uses it to get victory over us. And we don't have to beat ourselves up when we make mistakes. Now, I'm not condoning sin. I'm just simply saying that we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ who will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the text makes it very clear that God now, he's faithful. He's not going to allow us to be tempted above that which we can handle. And he'll make a way for us to get out of that temptation if we are aware that temptation now is a tool of the enemy to get you and I separated from God. And so all we have to do is recognize, okay, let's, let's, let's understand how this thing works. Now, the first thing that's really important now is to understand the source of temptation. Now, James chapter 1, verse 13, the text says, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. Now, temptation does not come from God. There's nothing in God to respond to sin. And so temptation never, ever comes from God. And so if you are tempted in a particular area, you need to understand first and foremost, God has nothing to do with it. Now, there's three sources now of temptation. This is going to be a review for some of you. The first one is the flesh. James chapter one, verse 14, the text says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So the Bible says that we are tempted because of the flesh. There has to be something within our flesh that entices, that, that allows us to be enticed. And so the Bible says that when we sin, it's born out of our desire. In other words, the only way for the enemy to tempt you is that there has to be something in you that the enemy can dangle before you to to for that, that thing in you to be drawn to, if you will. There has to be something going on in you that the enemy can feed to get you to, to, to be drawn to um, uh, his flow of temptation. Now, that desire within us is something that we have to deal with in terms of how we respond to temptation. Now, I'll get to that later, but that is key because Temptation will not work 
if there's not something in you that you have a desire for. Let me say that again. Temptation will not work. The devil, his attempt to tempt you will not work if there's nothing in you that he can entice. So there has to be something in you, it has to be something in me in order for the enemy to entice us. Because the text says we're drawn away by our own. The text says, when, uh, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And so there has to be something going on with us that the enemy can use to draw us into his flow of temptation. Now, the second thing uh, that we have to understand when it comes to the source of temptation is that not only is our flesh a source of temptation, uh, but the devil is a source of temptation. He deceives us. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse three, the NIV translation, the text says, and uh, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church. The text says, but I am afraid that just as he was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And so uh, the second way that we are um, enticed, if you were, is through deception. The enemy would deceive you, making you think that um, what you're doing and what you're going to get involved in is pleasurable and that it's going to benefit you. But at the end, it's not going to help you at all. It's a deception. And then the third thing that is a source of temptation is the world. We know that. That's why the Bible tells us to not to be conformed to the world. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, the text says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So it talks about the lust of the flesh, where you feel like doing something. You know you shouldn't do it, but you feel like doing it. And so you do it because of the flesh. The lust of the flesh wants it. And so you feel like doing it. You know you shouldn't do it, but you do it anyway. The lust of the eyes, which is your senses. You operate by your, your, your senses. So you sense, you use your eyes and your, your, your smell and your senses to, to, to do something. And then it talks about the pride of life. That's what you think, what you think you know. And so these three areas all operate in our lives in terms of enticement to sin. And it all is tied into the functioning of within the world, if you will, the world system, the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, the question is, when something comes at us, when we're being tempted to do something contrary to God's word, the, the, the question is, how are we going to respond? Now, again, remember, we're not going to get around temptation. It's just one of those tools that the enemy has to, to try to get at us. So that's not the issue. Temptation is going to be there. The issue is how are we going to respond to temptation when it comes? Now, we can respond in a way that we grow in God and we grow in our faith. Or we can respond inappropriately whereby sin enters into our lives and drives a wedge between us and God in terms of our relationship and our closeness to God. And so we can respond appropriately and grow in our faith or we can respond inappropriately and be pushed further away from our relationship with God. Now, this is important because where there's no choice, there's no freedom. Let me say that again. This is important because where there's no choice, there's no freedom. John 8, 36 says, who the son has set free is free indeed. Now, freedom is only a meaningful thing uh, if you have access to choice. Now, follow me. God places Adam and Eve in the garden and he has all these trees around him. And he says, of all these trees, you may freely eat. But this one particular tree you cannot touch. But in the day that you do touch it, you should surely die. And so the enemy comes and he tempts them. Now, understand, God did not put that tree in the garden, that one particular tree of knowledge of good and evil, in the garden to tempt Adam and Eve. 
No, he put that tree in the garden to give them a choice whereby they can choose to serve him or not serve him. Because that's what freedom is about. Freedom is about choice. So God did not put that tree there to, to, to tempt them. He put that tree there to give them a choice to serve him. Now, he let the devil do the tempting in the garden. He allowed the devil in to tempt them. Whereby tempting them, they had now to make a decision whether or not they're going to go with what God says or go with what the enemy says. And so temptation now, hear me, this is important when it comes to our spiritual growth. Temptation now is necessary for spiritual growth. Oftentimes we say, man, I just, I just hate that I'm being tempted. I just wish I wasn't so tempted. But you have to understand that we, God has made us free moral agents. And because we are free moral agents in Christ Jesus, who the Son has set free, is free indeed. Then temptation is necessary for us to grow in God. Because we have to choose to grow in God. We have to choose to push closer to God. We have to choose God over the adversary. And so what allows us to grow in our faith is the fact that the enemy is allowed to tempt us in our walk before the Lord. And so God is allowing you to be tempted because he is allowing you to grow in him. Let's put it like that. Some people say, well, if God loved me, why would he let me be tempted? He's allowing you to be tempted because God wants you to choose to grow in him. It's as simple as that. We, he gives us choice. Growth is tied to decision making. The only way that I'm going to grow in Christ Jesus is by making decisions that are in line with his word. And the more that I make decisions in line with the word of God, the more I grow in God. And so God allows temptation to come our way for us to, to grow in him. So it's necessary. Now, sin has steps to it. James chapter 1 verse 14, the text says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And so the first step to sin now starts with our desire. It starts with our lust. Sin doesn't just, I mean, it, temptation uh, is a process, if you will. And so you go through this process of temptation before it turns over to sin. And so the first step is that sin, it, it starts with a desire. You see something that you want, you know you shouldn't partake of it. And so God, you know, allows that temptation, if you will, to, to come your way so you can make a decision. Sin starts with a desire or lust. We have a desire. Let's go back to the desire. We have a desire to eat food. If we did not eat food, we'd starve to death. So God has placed a desire in us to eat. It is a natural desire. But when we now take that desire beyond its limits, it can turn into sin. It can turn, eating too much can turn into gluttony. God allows us to have sexual desires because if we didn't have sexual desires, then we would not uh, feel the need and find a need to replenish the earth. But now that sexual desire is to be um, uh, confined to a covenant relationship in marriage. But when we try to satisfy that desire outside of a covenant relationship in marriage, now sin is birthed in our lives. And so we have to understand that Desire is not bad, but it's bad when you try to satisfy it in an inappropriate way. And that's one thing we got to understand. Desire is not bad, but it becomes bad if you try to satisfy it in an inappropriate way. Um, a fish, when you go fishing, the only way to catch fish is you have to put bait on the, on the hook. If there's no bait on the hook, then you're not going to catch any fish. But you put bait on the hook and the fish sees the bait and goes after the bait, but not realizing that going after the bait, he's going after the hook. A rat sees cheese in a trap 
he goes after the cheese, not realizing that when he gets the cheese behind the disguise of the cheese is a trap. When a man sins, when we sin as human beings, when our desire becomes deception and we are drawn away, we don't see the consequences. Let me say that again. When we have a desire and our desire is disguised behind deception, we are drawn away by our desire, but we don't see the consequences of that desire. Now, second step is this. Your desire then produces life. Now, James chapter 1, verse 15, the text says, Then when lust has conceived. So the second step to sin is when your desire, my desire, then produces life. Sin does not happen because you have a desire. Let me say that again. Sin does not happen or does not take place in our lives just because we have a desire. It's when our will connects with our desire, only then do we sin. Let me say that again. When our will connects with our desire, that's when we sin. You have this big... Um, concept in your mind, this idea that's birthed into your mind when you put your, your, your behavior or your conduct behind uh, your thinking, that's when you sin. When we give consent to our will, when uh, we have a desire and our will wants to engage that desire is when we, put, when we put our consent behind our will to engage in that desire, that's when we sin. And so let me say that again, uh, sin now only is produced when our will is connected to our desire. Just because I desire something doesn't, doesn't mean I sin. It's when I put action behind what I desire is when sin is birthed in our lives. Now James chapter 1 verse 15 says the third step is that once our will connects to our desire, it brings forth death. The text says, then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And what that simply means is that our sin now brings distance between us and God. So anytime we are tempted of the devil and we buy into that temptation and our will connects to that desire, then we birth death or we birth a separation or a distance between us and God. Now, real quickly, about five minutes in, I'm going to be done with this teaching. How do we uh, appropriately respond to temptation? How do we, you know, okay, Pastor Doug, temptation is going to come. We know it's coming. What do we do? How do we appropriately respond to temptation? A couple of things here. One of the, 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 the key strategies to dealing with temptation is that you don't allow yourself to be placed in a situation whereby you know you're going to be tempted. In other words, if you know the enemy is going to use the tool of temptation, then take that, that tool away from him whereby you don't put yourself in a situation that you know you're going to be tempted. In other words, Ephesians 4, verse 27 puts it like this. It says, neither give place to the devil. See, the devil would take advantage of any compromising situation we give him. If you give the devil a compromising situation, he's going to take advantage of it. And so don't give the enemy an open door. Don't put yourself in an environment whereby the enemy can use the tool of temptation against you. I mean, if you know that you're struggling with pornography, then disconnect your, uh, put a lock on your computer or disconnect your, your phone from the internet. Don't put yourself uh, near or give yourself access to the temptation. Don't allow yourself to go in the environment where temptation can work on you. I mean, if you are, um, are struggling with, with eating, 
and uh, you, you know that that's an area in your life. Well, don't allow yourself to uh, hang out at uh, Dunkin' Donut or Pizza Hut when you know that food is a temptation for you. Remove yourself from those environments that easily allow the enemy to use the tool of temptation against you. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, the text says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. The text is really saying, you know, stop telling yourself you can handle it. Stop telling yourself, I'm going to be okay, I can handle this, when you know you can't handle it. If you can't handle a certain situation, uh, be honest with yourself. And stop telling yourself that you're strong and you're in, in uh, invincible, that you know, the enemy can't get you. The enemy can get you. He, he's gotten the best of our, our leaders throughout the Old Testament and the New. And we're no different. And so don't allow you, you, yourself to be placed in a situation where the enemy can contempt you. Especially if you know that's an area of weakness in your life. You know, resist temptation by resisting wrong places, by resisting wrong people. Don't, run, go, don't go around people who are people who you know are going to... Uh, invites you to do things that you know that is a temptation to you, uh, that you know that's wrong for you to be doing, or make it easier for you to do certain things that you know you just should not be doing. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, the text says, talking about Moses, choosing whether to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, the text is talking about Moses, how Moses he chose to be uh, afflicted with the children of Israel than to take the pleasures of, and enjoy the pleasures of, of Egypt. That's important because sin is pleasurable. Sin has pleasure. And for you or for me to tell myself that I'm not gonna enjoy certain things when I know that I'm gonna enjoy it and you know you're gonna enjoy it, is just deceiving ourselves. We would not sin if it wasn't pleasurable. The only reason we sin, the only reason we do things that we should not do is because there's pleasure attached to it. And so we have to choose now not to engage in those pleasures that we know are gonna be destructive to us. And by doing that, what we do is we focus on the big picture. By focusing on the big picture, it helps us to back away from those pleasures that are gonna be destructive to us. What do I mean by the big picture? recognize that, okay, if I allow myself to be tempted in this particular area, what's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my finances? What's going to happen to my physical body? What's going to happen? Uh, what are the consequences of me engaging in this behavior, even though I know it's going to be pleasurable, even though I really want to do it? What are the consequences behind me saying yes to this particular temptation of the enemy. And we should pray for our weaknesses. Not only should we be aware of our weaknesses and not place ourselves in environments where we can be tempted, but we should pray for our weaknesses. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, as I get ready to close this out, the text says, Jesus talking to his disciples, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation then Jesus says this, he's talking to his disciples, he says, watch and pray. And then he says this most powerful statement here. He says, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's a powerful statement because Jesus is saying that your spirit man wants to do the right thing. Your spirit man wants to obey the word of the Lord. He says, it is your flesh that gives in to the temptation. Your flesh is weak. So Jesus says, watch and pray. He says it's important for us to not deny or, or, or not, I shouldn't say deny, we should not operate in denial of our weaknesses, but we should pray for our weaknesses. Take inventory of your life. You know those areas that you struggle with. Don't deny that those areas are there. Acknowledge those areas of weaknesses and pray and ask the Lord to help you in those areas of weakness so the Holy Spirit can strengthen you in those areas. And remove yourself from people that try to be enablers to you. Remove yourself 
from areas that you know will enable you to do those things uh, more conveniently that you shouldn't be doing. Psalms 50 verse 15, as I close out, the text says, Call up on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. The Lord says, call upon him in the day of trouble. He says, and he will deliver you. And he will be glorified. God is saying, when you find yourself in the area of weakness, you find yourself being tempted, you find yourself in it where the enemy is attacking you, you come in on a spiritual attack in terms of temptation. God says, call out. Don't just stand there and try to resist. No, call out to God. God, help me in this area. Help me in this area of weakness. Lord, strengthen me in this area. Call out. Quote scripture. Get into the word. One of the best things you can do when you're struggling with temptation, man, is to grab the word of God. Grab the word of God and just start reading it out to yourself out loud. Start praying and asking the Lord to strengthen you out loud. He says, call up on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. That's a powerful statement right there. So, recognize that temptation is not a sin. It's only a sin when our will connects to our desire and we give birth to that thing that we have a desire for. And so, protect yourself from temptation. And how do you do that? You take it head on like Jesus did. Take it head on. Acknowledge, hey, it's going to come. I'm not exempt. It's common to man. It happens to everybody. I'm not going to live in denial. I'm going to take it head on. This is what's coming at me. This is what the enemy's trying to do. I'm going to remove myself from the temptation where it can have an upper hold on me. I'm going to pray and cry out to God so God can help me in this area of temptation. And God said, he'll do it. He'll deliver you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you tonight for this opportunity just to share in the word of the Lord. And Father, I pray that something was spoken this evening about the enemy and his strategy in terms of temptation that will help your people, God. I pray, God, that as the people of God embrace your word as they are obedient to scripture, that they will see the victory that they so desperately desire in the area of temptation. Father, we rebuke the adversary from having any place in the lives of your people. And we declare, Father God, that Jesus Christ is Lord over their lives. And we thank you for your faithfulness and all that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God for that word. Amen. Well, it is now offering time here at Harvest Rain Church where we bless the Lord in our giving. Amen. And I want to remind everyone and for some make them aware that we are sowing into the kingdom of Israel. Yes, we are blessing Israel especially. Pretty much ever since the Ukrainian war, we've decided to make sure that we send monies toward Israel. And I want to give you an opportunity to be a part of that. On your screen, you will see the text information, or you can go online and give that way to Israel. And amen, if you like, you can mail your offering in and that address is on your screen. Amen. Praise God. Now, over in Malachi, it talks about giving. Here at the church, our, our vision is to save, equip, mentor, and empower. Save souls, reaching out to, to, uh, for the lost and teaching the found, amen. And we need resources to do that, amen. And over in Malachi, it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Amen. So God is not only asking you to sow into his kingdom, into his house, but also letting you know as a result of your obedience, there's a blessing for you. Throughout the Bible, we, we can count numerous times where people have given or sown their last, given sacrificially, and God is blessing you. I'm reminded of the widow woman who had a suicide plan and the man of God came to her house and he said to her, go and make me a piece of bread or a piece of cake. And she said, you know, I only got a little bit of flour and uh, I'm going to bake it for my son and a little bit of oil and I'm, I'm going to bake a cake for my son and I and then we're going to die. And he said to her, do as you say you're going to do, but give me a piece of cake first. 
And as a result of her obedience, her taking care of that man of God, she did not run out of flower. Amen. So I want to encourage you to not only obey God's word in giving, but also expect him to bless you as a result. Now, we don't give to get, but as a result of, of, of our obedience, we are blessed. Amen. So if you've prepared your offering or you're, or you're prepared to give your offering, you can point your hand into the screen as a point of contact. Or lift your offering up, I'm going to pray for it. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the word that went forth. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every person under the sound of my voice, dear God. I pray, dear God, and thank you for their obedience to your word, dear God, for sowing into your kingdom. And I pray and ask as a result of their obedience, dear God, that you meet them at their point of need. Heavenly Father, I pray that you open up the floodgates and pour out a blessing that they won't have room enough to receive in Jesus' name. Dear God, I pray and ask you to bless Harvest Rain Church. I pray that you bless this seed and multiply, dear God. I pray that as a result of their obedience that this seed will stretch and touch lives all over the world, dear God. I pray and ask this in your son Jesus' name to bless and multiply these seeds. In your son Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Thank you again for tuning in. I ask that you tune in next time. But until then, you be blessed.